Good evening, everybody. Uh, hope today finds you well. Uh, we are in Romans chapter 8. I got my boys here with me. They're coloring, but hopefully they'll talk with us. Um, but we are in Romans chapter 8, and this is a very, very good chapter filled with a lot of things that uh, I'm just going to tell you I've got a passion for Scripture. And, and something I hope that you uh, would help pay attention to, you know, um, something I hope that you would uh, get to see, you know, is that Scripture isn't something we should just breeze through. You know, I hope that, you know, you see we do these hour-long studies or, or however long they might be every single week because Scripture is extremely important. It's important for us to um, be able to uh, examine Scripture, to kind of break it apart, to, to really look at it. Um, one of the biggest problems that faces many, many Christians, and this isn't just here in the United States, it's all over the world. One of the biggest problems that faces many Christians is that we neither know nor understand the Bible. We've got a few scriptures that we pick out. We've got a few scriptures that we um, like to talk about. And, and a lot of times we really don't understand what they're talking about. So we've got to kind of get down into the context of everything. Um, so as you know, if you've been following our Wednesday studies, Romans was written to a church that was split on an issue. It was split across cultural and ethnic boundaries. On the one hand, you had the Jewish population. On the other hand, you had the Gentile population. Um, the emperor at uh, some months prior, um, several, I mean, a while prior to this, had uh, driven out the Jews from the province of Rome. And uh, that early church that was started there was a, a blend of Jewish and Roman Christians. Well, they had followed certain customs, they had done certain things, but when um, the Jews came back after the exile was done, they didn't recognize the church anymore. And so you had two people on either side of the issue claiming to be superior. Doesn't that sound familiar in our age of um, secularism invading the church? In the age where you know we like to um, you know make church about issues that are not issues. And so Paul's saying that yes, the Jews are important, and we need to recognize that as Christians ourselves. The Jews received Jesus first. They received the law of Abraham, they, they received, of Moses. They, they, Abraham was chosen. Jesus was Jewish. The apostles were Jewish. But the Gentiles also received it. And so the Jews' job was not to make them believers like themselves. The core issues then that Paul begins to tackle are sin versus salvation. Following the law which does not save, it was good because God designed it, but all the law does is point to our deficiencies. It points to how inadequate we are. Say hi, Phineas. Hi. The law points to um, how we fail. And so that's kind of what we're talking about. What Paul said is that when we put on Christ, we divorced that old self that was bound by the law. And so we have put on a new self. We've divorced our flesh and have put on the spirit. Um, oftentimes when we sin, we're doing something we really don't want to do. Um, at times we, we don't do the things we ought to do and we know we should. And so um, we, we've got this sin problem and only Christ can rescue us from it. That's what Paul is trying to convey to the Roman church. You see, here's what Paul's doing. He's trying to bridge the gap between two different uh, ethnic groups clashing with one another in the church. What a timely message. <laughs> Isn't this something that, that the Lord has given us to such a time as this? And so what we need to do is recognize that all have sinned. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is not a single righteous person. No one is better than the other. And the problems that we face within the church have everything to do with the sin that is buried and takes root within us. We have no place with the world. Not that uh, we need to distance ourselves from the world, but we're to be in the world, not of it. At the Last Supper, Jesus prayed for his disciples. He said, Father, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, 
but that we may function as God's people in the world. This world is not our home. This isn't all there is, and we fight like it is. We are not citizens of this world. We are citizens of a kingdom that is eternal, yet we hold on to things like it is. And we like to look down on each other. We like to fight each other. We like to judge each other. So verse 8 opens up with this beautiful verse that I think is so wonderful. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you hear that? I think I need to say that. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So why, Christians, do we sling stones at each other? I've been watching what people do on social media, and quite frankly, I'm going to say it disgusts me. If no condemnation exists for those who are in Christ Jesus, why do we sling stones at one another? I've seen friendships that have spanned over a decade, possibly more than one decade, Divided over issues that are temporary. I've seen Christians attacking other Christians because of who they, they vote for politically. It's wrong. It's wrong that we attack each other on things that are not based on eternity. That are not based upon the, the thing that gives us life. We shouldn't be attacking each other, period. And the only time we should judge one another is when we deviate from the gospel. So if there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, put your stones down. If there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, you and I have no right to pick the speck of dust out of our brother's eye when there's a tree growing out of our own. We are judging people who are just as broken as we are, who need a Savior just as much as we do. Stop looking down on someone. Stop letting Satan divide his church. It doesn't matter what skin color. It doesn't matter the denomination. It doesn't matter all these other things that we use, that the world uses to divide us up. We can stand and agree upon the word of the Lord because we are all in Christ Jesus and no condemnation exists for us. So we've got to be careful. He goes on this. Because the Spirit's law of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. If Christ's Spirit, if the Holy Spirit has set us apart, has set us free from the law of sin and death, why do we continue to act as if we're under it? We act like judge, jury, and executioner. Only God sits on that throne. I don't want to be on it. So let's put down our stones. As Jesus said in John chapter 8, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. What the law could not do, since it was limited in the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in flesh like ours, under sin's domain, and as a sin offering, in order that the law's requirement would be accomplished in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. You know, that's where all this jealousy and rivalry and condemnation comes from. It comes from our flesh. When I see people online who are trying to pick apart someone else's salvation, who you don't even know, based upon political ideologies <laughs> that you disagree with. Now, there's certain things that we can see are fruits of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5 lays them out quite clearly. The Bible speaks of the flesh quite clearly. But why do we grandstand instead of, as Jesus says, if we have something against our brother, we're to go to them personally. And if you can't go to that person, uh, that, that person personally, take it off of Facebook. Take it off of Instagram and Snapchat and, and Twitter and whatever else you do. Christians, we shouldn't be throwing stones at one another. Jesus said, they will know you are my disciples by how you love one another. Love is a supernatural thing. John writes in 1 John, if you do not know love, you do not know God. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Verse 3 says, what the 
law could not do since it was limited by the flesh, God did. He condemns sin in the flesh by sending his own son in flesh like ours under sin's domain and as a sin offering. Something that happened. Let's, let's take a look at this for a minute. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, who were both flesh and spirit, divorced the spirit by going after the desires of their flesh. That fruit, that thing that was forbidden them. They were given leave to do anything else except that one thing. And so they charged after their sin. And they, they, they divorced the spirit and unionized with the flesh and death. So what Jesus did, he undid that through his obedience. What Adam and Eve did in disobedience, Christ did in obedience. He divorced sin and flesh and death and unionized with the flesh and the spirit. And that's who we're supposed to be. That's what he calls us to. What, what the first Adam could not do, Jesus as the second Adam did. Listen to this. And as a sin offering, in order that the law's requirement would be accomplished, accomplished in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Again, I suggest read Galatians 5, um, 20 all the way to the end of the chapter. For those who live according to the flesh, think about the things of the flesh. Let's consider that for a minute. We think about politics, and it bothers us. We think about uh, entertainment. And we get agitated when we're not entertained. We think about the, the things we purchase and buy. We think about all our, our stuff. We think about our relationships, which not any of these things are in and of themselves necessarily bad. But instead of God occupying our mind, instead of meditating on his word day and night, we meditate on the things of the flesh. And so we are, are, are showing by our fruit who we belong to. But those who live according to the Spirit, think about the things of the Spirit. Do you meditate upon the Word of God day and night? Do you act as the psalmist in Psalm 119, who just loves the Word of the Lord and says in verse 105, Your Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Does God's Word guide you at every step? We're going to talk about this in Romans 12. Are you conformed to the pattern of this world? Are you transformed by the renewing of your mind? Can you truly and honestly test the will of God? Because the word of God is hidden so well within your being that you meditate upon it all day and night. You let it affect every decision you make. That's what we can know. That's how we can test the spirit is through his word. For the mindset of the flesh is death. Think about this for a minute. That's a hard thing for us to comprehend. If you want to feed him honey, you can. The mindset of the flesh is death. It's always thinking about the things of this world. If we are in the flesh, we're constantly worried about our real estate. We're worried about our bills. We're worried about our houses. We're worried about our, our lives. We're worried about our livelihoods. We're worried about this, that, and the other. Instead of saying, okay, Lord, I surrender to you and I trust you. The mindset of the things of this world, when we are worried about the things of this world, we are worried about our relationships, we are worried about the things that we have no control over, is the mindset of the flesh. The mindset of the spirit is life and peace. One of the promises in God's word is peace beyond understanding. If we are focused upon God, if God is truly in control, if God is the owner of our soul and all that we have and we put our relationships in his hands and we put our, our complete and utter trust in his hands and we put everything that we have and are and ever will be, our relationships, our, our jobs, our finances, our money, if it all belongs to him, there's peace. The peace beyond understanding comes from knowing that God is in charge of the outcome. We can only have peace through Christ if we give it all to him. You cannot have Jesus and anything else. It is Jesus alone. Jesus will fix our relationships. Jesus, because of him, our marriages will be better. Because of him, our parenting will be better. Our relationships will be better. And if those relationships don't get reconciled, we do all we can as far as it is from us. Again, Romans chapter 12. We're going to talk about that in a few weeks. 
but we do all we can for the cause of Christ. We submit everything to him. We surrender all to him. We sing that in church, but I wonder sometimes if we do it. And so, listen to this. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit itself to God's law for it is unable to do so. We just talked about that. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Woo, maybe a little louder for those in back. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's why people who want to have everything, you want to have your sin and God. I'm just going to say it flat out. We have denominations, we have whole churches, we have things like that that are trying to simply say, well, you know, uh, God made me this way. And so we've allowed homosexuality into the church, and we've allowed transgenders. Not that we should condemn people, because guess what? In those churches, it says in 1 Corinthians, such as some of you were. Some of you were those things, but God has set you free from them. I know it's controversial, but you know what? I'm not going gonna, gonna to preach the word of God, even if it makes me unpopular. I've been reading through Jeremiah. Woo! Jeremiah was unpopular throughout his entire ministry. If we are in the flesh, we cannot please God. And so, when we, what we do when we get baptized, it's more than just a symbol. It's more than just an identity issue. We are crucifying our flesh with Christ. We are burying our flesh with Christ. And we are rising a new creation, just as Christ did, putting sin to death. And death to death. Rising again, a completely new creation, submitted to God. We put our old habits, we put our lust to death. We put our flesh to death. We put all the things that do not please God to death. And he creates in us something new. Jesus said this, you cannot put new wine in old wineskins nor old wine in new wineskins. If you do, you will burst the skin and ruin the wine. You cannot have both. You can have one or the other. That's it. You, however, he's talking to you and I, even though he's writing to the Romans way back then, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, since the spirit of God lives in you. But if it does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not, or if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Flat out. And what was the spirit of Christ? Philippians 2 verse 5 says this. That he did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, but put on human flesh and made himself as a slave. He was obedient even unto death, death on the cross. Sorry, what was that verse? So you don't have the spirit of Christ? No. Philippians 2, 5 is the reference I made. So, going on. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. This is why baptism is so important. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who has raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. If that same power dwells in you, then you have victory over death. You have victory over lust. You have victory over greed. You have victory over homosexuality, over fornication, over immorality of all sorts. If the Spirit of God lives in you, you have victory. And if you're not reaching that victory, then you have to say, okay, Lord, where am I falling short? Where am I wrong? What am I not doing? How am I falling short? Or pray as David did in Psalm 139. Lord, search me and know my heart. And if there is any grievous way within me, remove it. Verse 12 says, So then, brothers, we're not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. When the world says we have to conform, we don't. We are only to be conformed to Christ. The world is dying. So why do we try so much to appease and please? I'm going to tell you something. When you give in to demands of an enemy, you are never going to appease that enemy. No matter how we try and paint the church to look, no matter how relevant we try to become, 
We are never going to please the world because the world is never satisfied by God. We cannot win over the world by being like the world. We cannot win over the world. We cannot win over those who we love who are bound by sin by becoming just like them and accepting sin as sin. It's only by the word of God, only by the cleansing of the washing of the water with the word, just like it says in Ephesians 5, 21, all the way to the end. It is only by washing of water through the word. It is only by being pure before God, by believing God. It is only that way that, that we can be conformed to him. We have to give it all to him. We cannot hold anything back, no matter how much it hurts. I'm going to borrow from Francis Chan. I love quoting this quote. This is a great quote. He says, if I come to a part of the Bible that I disagree with, I have to assume I'm wrong. That's a hard thing to, to admit. But if I'm trying to, to please God, then I'm not going to live according to my flesh. I'm going to live according to the Spirit. I'm going to seek the Holy Spirit. I'm going to seek out and, and live by the Spirit. Now listen to this. For if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. <laughs> but, if you, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Hmm. All those led by God's Spirit are God's sons. For if you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children, also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, seeing that we suffer with him so that we may be glorified with him. If we live according to the Spirit, we will suffer. We're going to have tribulation. We're going to have trials. If we, if we live according to the way, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to say this to you guys. I'm glad you guys are here. When I was growing up, I was picked on a lot because I was always trying to do the right thing. Because I fell in love with God when I was young. And unfortunately, when I got into middle school and high school, I started pulling away. And I pulled away quite a bit because I was tired of, of the persecution I received. People were cruel. They said some horrible things that to this day still stick with me. To some, I mean, they said I had AIDS. <laughs> they said all sorts of things because I refused to go along with the rest of the crowd. Jesus promises us in this world we will have what? Persecution, tribulation, trials, and troubles. But he said, be of good cheer because he's what? Do you guys know? He has won. He has overcome the world. So we're going to face persecution if we decide to follow the Spirit. It's going to happen. My wife and I have faced it throughout all of our ministry, haven't we, Michael? We've been persecuted and faced trials of different kinds because we've decided to follow Christ when it wasn't popular. We, we didn't meet the demands that people put on us to be people pleasers and to accommodate. We decided to stick to what the Holy Spirit committed us to, and we've suffered for it. But we can rejoice in that because Christ suffered, and the apostles suffered. And all the disciples suffer. So we are sharing with the crucifixion of the flesh alongside Christ. That's why we rejoice. So it goes on. Verse 18. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is going to be revealed for us, to us. For the creation eagerly awaits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of corruption into the glorious freedom of God's children. So you see, when we submit to God and we put on Christ and we put on that freedom, all of creation rejoices because at Adam and Eve's sin, it was subject to Satan and to sin. So let us rejoice. Let us rejoice in our present sufferings. It's going to happen. Fighting back, throwing stones back when people throw them at you, creating rivalries and dissensions, those are works of the flesh. 
But if we're the spirit, we're going to rejoice just as Paul and Silas, when they got beaten up, what did Paul and Silas do? They sang praises. And what happened? There was a great what? There was an earthquake. So Paul is talking from personal experience. There was a great earthquake. They were singing praises to God in their suffering and creation rejoiced alongside them and it shook off their what? Chains. And it opened the what? Doors. And people got what? Saved. People got saved. Creation groaned alongside Paul and Silas was rejoicing. It shook off their chains. It opened the doors and the jailer and his entire family. And I would even say, I don't know if this was written. I don't know what, what Luke would say, but I wonder if some of those prisoners who experienced and witnessed that got saved as well. It's kind of interesting. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. And not only that, but we ourselves, who had the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption to the redemption of our bodies. So you see, do you want to see change? Do we want to see change in our world? Do we want to see ethnic change? Uh, relations get better. Here's what we do. We submit to the spirit and we serve and love our enemies. We wash the feet of those who would attack us. We love them and we don't fight them back. What would have happened had Jesus fought back against his attackers, I wonder? We'd be doomed. But instead, they said, are you Jesus of Nazareth? He spoke and said, I am. And you remember what happened when he said, I am? They all fell to the ground. Did Jesus fight back when they were accusing him and pulling out his beard and hitting him? Did Jesus fight back when they were lying to him and then trying to get him to perform miracles as, a, as an amusement? Jesus said no word in his own defense. Instead, he submitted to the will of God. And we are all here because of that. Guys, Miss Selena says she loves you and you're wonderful examples, especially to adults. I conveyed the message, Miss Selena. Now listen to that. Now in this hope, we are safe. Yet hope that is seen is not hope because who hopes for what he sees? So here's the thing. We are moving onward towards something we can't see. This kingdom that has no end. This immortal or this immortal soul trapped inside a, a decaying body. And some of us feel that right now, don't we? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. So here's what I'm going to suggest. Some of us are so worried about what's going on around us right now. We're worried about the future of our kids. We're worried about the future of our country. We're worried about the future of our world. If you're in uh, Africa right now, I mean, the Fulani herdsmen are, are devastating Nigerian Christians. But this has been going on for us since the beginning, since Christ left. Those who were faithful in the Old Testament were often ridiculed, murdered, stoned, and beaten. If we make a stand for God, we're going to face persecution. But what we leave behind is greater, or, or what we go towards is greater than what we leave behind. We've got to remember that. Be patient for it. Struggle for Christ and seeing him face to face and hearing well done. And here's the thing. Try and bring as many of your enemies to him as possible. That's why we love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Just as Jesus did. Just as Paul did. Just as Stephen did. Just as everyone who is in the spirit does. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. See, we're not justified by our works, by our struggles, by our fight. We are justified in Christ alone. There's nothing we can do. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. It's something that he gives. 
but only as we wait upon him and surrender. So here's what Paul writes in verse 31. What are we then to say about these things? Actually, I'm going to stop for a minute. Verse 28. Let's go back to that. It's one of my favorite verses. Listen to this. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Listen to that. Does it say that all things are good? No, it says God works to his good and to our good according to his purpose. Whatever you're struggling with, whether it's a health issue, a financial issue, or, or whatever, here's what I'm going to suggest you do. Submit to God. Remove from yourself the false idols that you put there. I've got to do the same. I'm preaching to me here. And let's remember that even the things that don't feel good, God will use for our good. But we have to make sure that we are living as if we are called according to his good purposes. Moving on then. What then shall, are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not even spare his own son. So why would he give us health and wealth and comfort? Why is that a gospel that we accept within our churches? But offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? Ooh, I love it. God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that not even death or life, angels or rulers, things present or things to come, hostile powers, height or depth or any other created thing can separate us. Or will have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ our Lord. I hope that encourages you. No matter what we face in this life, there is nothing that can separate us from the power of God. Why? Because he has called you. You are in his right, victorious, righteous right hand. We might face some persecution for a little while. But it's only for a little while. And just as the old spiritual song says, soon and very soon we are going to see the king. But we have to wait. We have to endure the present suffering with hope. We have to seek out our Lord with patience, seeking even the welfare of our bitterest enemy. Paul was such a one. He was a killer of Christians, and yet he wrote the majority of the New Testament. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, and endure. Jesus tells John in the Revelation, he who endures conquers, and he who endures, he will let us sit with him. He will let us sit with him on his throne. But we have to endure. We cannot abide the flesh. And if we're living by the flesh, I'm going to pray. I'm praying for you now. Father God, I just pray that those of us who are stuck in our flesh, that you would free us from the bonds of it. By your son, Jesus Christ, in his name, amen. Let go of the bonds of flesh. Don't live according to the desires or according to the ways of this world. The world is passing away. And we cannot excuse sin simply because we love someone. If you love someone, you're going to tell them about Jesus. Because if they like you in this lifetime and yet are still going to hell, what's the point? We can send people to hell with a full stomach. We can send people to hell with high self-esteem. We can send people to hell with a false sense of security. We need to preach the word. And we need to understand that we are going to fall. We are going to fail. We're going to stumble sometimes. But God uses, like it says in verse 28 of tonight's chapter, all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I've made some big blunders in my life and in my ministry. And God has used them all for my benefit and my good. And I pray for your spirit. God bless. We'll see you next week. And I hope all is well with you.